Um, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to our first talent webinar. I'm Jo Summers, Chief Client Officer at Lamp House Strategy, and this is our first collaborative event with Chambers and Partners, sharing insights from our new Leading Teams project. The call is being recorded today. We've had quite a lot of people requesting the uh, playback, so the, it will be recorded, uh, but there is also a Q&A function. So should you wish to raise any questions, we'll be making time to do so later on. We've got about 45 minutes of, of main content. We've spent the last six months designing and starting to build a unique talent benchmark for the legal industry. And we're really delighted to share some of those early findings with you today and let you know how your firms can, part can participate in leading teams and access this new data. So for today's agenda, we'll tell you more about leading teams and we'll also be covering trends in the drivers of high performance amongst ranked Chambers partners, the importance of culture in building your high performing teams, how hybrid working policies are being adopted and their contributions to advocacy, as well as a first look at new levers to create partner advocates. I'd now like to introduce David Johnson, Director of Client Services, and Lisa Hart Shepherd, CEO of Lamp House Strategy, and Anthony Cook, Head of Product from Chambers and Partners. I'm looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts on the new insights today. And firstly, Anne, I'd really like to ask you to share a bit more about the collaboration and the background to this new talent benchmark. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, so at Chambers, we're really excited to be collaborating with Lamp House Strategy to create the legal industry's first ever legal talent benchmark. So for a bit of background about me, I built the talent products and the research at Chambers under Chambers Associate and Chambers Student. Um, when we develop, developed that research back in 2016, we started to see some fascinating trends across the profession. Different people with different identities and backgrounds when faced with the structures and varying cultures and practices in the profession, they experienced life differently and we saw clear patterns forming across the market. And in doing this, we saw there was a lot that could be improved about the way firms engage and look after their talent. And that with our data, we had the tools to create something meaningful for law firms that would help law firms themselves take control of the cultural and structural issues we were seeing. So we started talking to Lamphouse, who are, by the way, the team behind Acritas and the talent research Acritas Stars. And we learned about their ESG mission, their natural interest in creating sustainable working cultures and their expertise in legal industry data and insights. And we felt a partnership was definitely the right way forward. So we established the Leading Teams project, which gives law firms a vital source of market intelligence to help law firms attract, motivate and retain high performing talent. So how are we going to do that? So firstly, what we'll do is identify what matters to members of your firm in their practices and, and against their peer firms. It will then compare measures of success against what we see from your peer group, showing you where your strengths and weaknesses lie and the degree to which something is an area for attention. And finally, we'll help firms learn from best practice. So where there's an opportunity to lead or a risk to reduce, we'll reveal how other firms might be tackling a problem more effectively. So where have we come from and where are we going? Well, over the past eight years, we've surveyed 27,000 associates, which generated 2.5 million data points and enabled us to understand what mattered to lawyers across all corners of the profession. This research helped us build the Leading Teams project, teaching us what we need to prioritise in a body of research to get to the heart of team engagement and performance at every law firm. So just as a snapshot of the kind of thing we're able to see, how did the pandemic affect lawyer engagement? As you can see, the positive attributes, happiness, benefits package, work-life balance all took a hit, which uh, at the same point, stress increased. But by 2023, the natural order was restored. We can see most KPIs being restored to their original position, with two exceptions though. So during the pandemic, partners clearly started investing more in their team's career progression because partners are nurturing future leaders better. And the second point, work-life balance has not really been restored to its original level, and that came in parallel with the changes we've seen in lifestyle through hybrid working. Then on the right, what we've also been able to see is that very clearly every corner of the market faces its own very specific set of challenges. Even before we embarked upon the leading teams project, the level of market granularity we were able to apply was already unparalleled. So here, for example, 
we're looking at, at lawyer retention patterns across practice areas and with clear groupings of the core practices showing weaker retention and specialised or niche practices showing stronger retention. So in the analysis you'll see later in this session, while the findings are based on market averages, the level of granularity we will deliver eventually will be at sector and practice level, speaking to the specific challenges we know firms face in each sector. So where are we, where are we in our benchmark research? Um, our research, research opened in March. At the moment, we're working with firms to schedule participation by June 30th. Research then remains open until 30th of September. At that point, we'll deliver the 2023 Legal Talent Benchmark. So far in our research, we've reached out to a sample of 400 ranked partners to conduct an early survey with. They represent 180 law firms covering the US and the UK. And we'll take you through an analysis of that data as a sneak preview of the market analysis we'll deliver later in the year. But briefly, the key learning we've made in all of this, happily, is that culture is king which is brilliant because it echoes everything we've researched with associates for years and years at Chambers. Culture is obviously extremely broad, however, but within that we're seeing clear drivers of engagement across the industry. Now I'm going to pass over to David to introduce how we analysed some of these themes. Thank you, Anthony. Really excited to share some of this early, this kind of early developing content with you all today. Um, so Anthony mentioned, uh, we've designed this benchmarking study to essentially try and track what drives engagement and motivation across a range of different um, measures which we think are specific and unique to life at a law firm. So within those, we're benchmarking engagement against almost 50 different metrics. So it's a very holistic piece of work looking at the full breadth of life at the firm. One of the things that we want to unpick is of all those different areas of life in the firm, from how the work is allocated to the culture within teams, leadership strategy, REM strategy, career progression opportunities and pathways, across this kind of broad range of areas, what are the things that actually really drive satisfaction, engagement, retention, uh, motivation? And crucially, how do those change if you're a partner or an associate, um, uh, a QE or even a business professional? I guess kind of ultimately what we're trying to get a sense of is if you're developing your talent strategy in 2023, what are the key things that you really need to get right? And how does your firm measure up on those compared to competitors? So we've kicked off the project, as Anthony mentioned, and we've had a really strong response so far from our soft launch with ranked partners. And I'm going to talk you through now some of those early findings around kind of what's motivating and engaging this particular group, just to give you a sense of where this product's going and what we're hoping to be able to kind of bring everybody uh, over the coming months. Now, let me explain this little bit of um, a little bit about this particular piece of analysis before we get into the detail. And apologies for going kind of full geek mode on you all <laughs> kind of so early, but but the stuff that's coming through is fascinating. I hope you agree. Um, kick things off, we've done some correlation analysis of all the different areas of life of the firm to see you know, which areas have the strongest relationship with satisfaction. So each blue dot on this chart represents an area of life of the firm. So the further to the right the dot is, the stronger the correlation of satisfaction. So the more likely it is to drive um, happiness and engagement in the role. Further to the top of the chart, the more satisfied people in the market are of this particular area. So Top right, these are things that are crucial to partner engagement at the moment. Uh, and so far from our analysis of what's been coming through, most firms in the market seem to be kind of getting these areas right. As you kind of move down towards the bottom left, what we see from these dots is these are less likely to ultimately drive satisfaction. And we're also seeing more variation in experience across firms. So kind of some firms getting it right, some firms potentially kind of struggling with some of these areas. The first takeaway before we even talk about what the dots are, I guess, is notice the spread. There's huge variation in here. Not all areas of life and firm are equal in terms of their impact on engagement with this partner group. There's a clear sense of prioritisation emerging in terms of actually what really matters. Secondly, and this is what we're going to talk through next, is there's some really interesting patterns emerging as to kind of what drives engagement with this group and you know, some early indicators as to kind of how firms are reacting. So let's have a look at some of these patterns. Um, 
The first is there's a group of attributes that are really defining high engagement in the life of rank partners. We've called these the sort of the non-negotiables. These are really strong drivers statistically, uh, and by and large, people are pretty engaged with them. So these drive these are the drivers that you don't get the conditions right around these at the firm, you've potentially lost engagement of some of your highest performers. Now, what's interesting is, first of all, I guess, what's not in here? So this group isn't talking about remuneration. They're not talking about bonus, or at least subconsciously, they're not talking about bonus uh, remuneration and recognition. Uh, when we look at the statistical analysis, it's all about the culture of their team, the level of camaraderie, the togetherness, the kind of sense that they're all pulling in the same direction. This sense that they're part of a tight knit unit that can work together in a really effective way and collectively deliver big things, um, absolutely crucial. So culturally, in terms of getting those elements of the team dynamic right, it's interesting. This is the biggest drive of happiness engagement from this ranked partner cohort so far. Now, the next group that's emerging, uh, we're calling these our leadership levers. So um, these are areas that still have a really big influence on satisfaction and happiness at the firm, um, but they include things which are arguably more open to influence by firm policy and interventions. Um, and also interesting, these are areas where we're starting to see potentially some firms deliver mixed results. So the things that are falling into this group, it's all about strategy, vision and communication and how well these three things are kind of being executed upon. So things like creating space for leadership, face time for partners, confidence in the trajectory of the firm and the strategy that management are kind of putting in place to get there, how that's all communicated, hugely important to this group. Um, so understanding where the firm lands on this relative to competitors is going to be fascinating as we get through sort of more granular detail of working with this firm, with firms on an individual basis. And then our third, um, I guess, kind of tranche that's coming through uh, of drivers is incredibly interesting. And it's interesting because arguably these are things that either we didn't necessarily expect to see have such an impact on engagement and happiness at a firm with this partner group, but also things that are relatively new and maybe weren't even on the radar five years ago. So we're calling this group the, the new differentiators for employer brand. They've got a strong relationship with satisfaction. But what we are seeing is real mixed results in terms of levels of happiness, uh, levels of engagement with them across the firm. Um, so with these uh, drivers, there's huge opportunity for us to kind of stand out and differentiate in the market if you can get them right. Um, and what's in there is fascinating. It's all about how well the firm is positioning itself to becoming a more responsible business. So is the firm committed to DNI? Is it com genuinely committed to chat climate change pro bono? Are the claims around it being a responsible business authentic or are they just seen as a communications uh, exercise? Are firms creating flexible working policies that work for its people in 2023? Are there meaningful well-being initiatives in place uh, with the support of culture? Um, it's fascinating to see these things come through, have such an impact. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Apologies have such an impact on satisfaction uh, and arguably, you know, statistically coming up higher than some of the things we might have expected to see there, such as pay, bonus, uh, remuneration, etc. So uh, you can see we're starting to get a sense of what's really driving this group and what's going to be really compelling from a talent strategy perspective, we think, is how these measures between how these measures kind of differ when we look at the differences between partners associates trainees business professionals whether culturally you're based in london or new york or so, some other big financial center um there will be differences of this uh, and we're going to start to uncover these as we move through the coming weeks um just want to pause for a second uh, and bring Anthony back in because Anthony, you've kind of worked closely on the associate side. Obviously, we're looking very specifically at this early results from coming from rank partners. Uh, how do you see these kind of drivers and these partners differ from what you've seen come through from some of your previous work with the associate community? Well, thanks, David. Um, really fascinating to see that data. Um, the wonderful thing is here that you can see quite strong symmetry between um, the associate data and what we're seeing from partners now. So what we saw over the course of the past eight years is that the absolute non-negotiables 
are all about culture, how well you fit in in particular, and uh, career progression. And what is really heartening to see is that those values are not lost throughout the, the career, even when you get to sort of the sort of pinnacle of the profession, career progression is still a concern to partners. Secondly, the leadership levers. So um, perhaps in, the, in this area, you might want to see a little bit more desire for autonomy from the junior levels, but those points about communication are really fundamental and always echoed up and down the hierarchy. Um, where we, we might see strategy play in, and this is a really important one, is how the person views the alignment between their own aspirations and their careers and how well aligned they are with the direction they believe the firm to be going in. And when you've got a successful career, the two are pretty well aligned. Um, and finally, the new battle, battleground for employer brand. This is absolutely fascinating because it, this has in generally been, well, there's been a perception that this has been the currency of the sort of junior upcoming new graduate classes, and they come in with sort of more, more principled view of what their uh, career should look like, and then sort of throughout the course of their career shed those principles as they become more senior. But actually, what is wonderful is you can see those principles continuing, and that partners are actually taking ownership of those principles. So there's far more symmetry than perhaps some of the conversations we've had with law firms have identified there to be some kind of generational clash. Uh, this doesn't look like that's as pronounced as perhaps it is being communicated. So very interesting. So stepping back and, and taking that data in, it appears to me that culture was a, a very important thread throughout all of those drivers of high performance. And I understand that there is more that you can share with us about the fundamentals of building a high performance culture in a firm, David. There are, and there's some really compelling ingredients of kind of what maybe good and bad culture looks like emerging from the research so far. And I think also what's really exciting is we're starting to get a sense of some of the tangible things that firms can do through policies and interventions that can make an impact. Um, we've picked five areas of culture that we're seeing come through from the research so far that have a kind of a big impact on this group. So flexibility, inclusivity, support structures, reward and authenticity. Um, and I thought what might be nice use of our time today is together with kind of bringing Lisa in for some of her expert views, unpack what each of these one by one and have a look at what the research is telling us in terms of the impact of these on culture and maybe try to get a sense of what good and maybe less of good looks like when it comes to each of them. Um, so maybe let's let, let's start with flexibility. So uh, and specifically the impact that return to office policies are having on engagement. Mm -hmm. So in this study we are tracking the different return to office mandates that firms are putting in place and so far across the almost 200 firms that we've kind of received kind of data and contributions from you can see that there are three main policy responses starting to emerge uh, in response to the return to the office question we've seen kind of most people going down either the mandated for three days in the office uh route mandated for two days or going around right about 25% of the market's case, going that fully flexible and giving everybody else the freedom, to, everybody the freedom to choose, I guess. Now, what we found out so far, uh, and we know from this group, from the driver analysis, is that flexibility is kind of really key for this kind of group of partners. And this is reflected in a really material way in the net promoter scores of those with fully flexible return to work policies. So what we're seeing, is that those with fully flexible policies are significantly more likely to recommend their firms as a place to work than those that have got mandates. Now it's early days, um, but there's two and there's two interesting points that I think are probably worth sort of exploring a little bit here. Firstly, um, the three-day mandate is actually generating a higher advocacy rate than the two-day mandate. So there's almost something to be said about if you're going to mandate, make sure you do more days of a week to create more certainty. Uh, maybe the two day mandate is too much of a halfway house, potentially leading to inefficiency. I think this is one that we're going to explore in a lot more detail as we start to kind of move through the rest of the research. And there's a second interesting point is kind of when we looked at how much time people actually spent in the office across all of the categories, the three day a week mandate in the fully flexible group um, both had almost exactly the same number of days in the office in reality. So the reality of time spent in the office for both groups was actually exactly the same, but there was something about giving that flexibility to people that really resonated with what they value. And the result is it's, you know, it looks like it's starting to really kind of impact 
engagement in a material way. Mm -hmm. uh, fascinating. I mean, Lisa, bring you in for your kind of thoughts on what kind of your take on kind of what we're seeing play out here. Um, well, first of all, I love this. It's really great to see some hard numbers and be even better as the data grows. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to look at this by location because we can already see when we're looking at sort of the main centres that locations where there's a long crowded commute tend to value flexibility more than those where they tend to live closer to the office, et cetera. We also know um, from previous work that demographics really matter here. So caregivers, for example, highly, highly value flex. So I think it's it's another example of where one size shouldn't fit all because different people have different preferences and needs and different home lives that they're dealing with. I guess the second angle that we're not seeing yet because we haven't got the associate piece is how the associates feel when their partners aren't there. Um, mm. And this is something we'll be able to look at. But for now, what we can see from this data standalone is that partners value having control over where they spend their working lives. Yeah. Um, and that's really interesting because I think that idea of flexibility and having that control around flexibility feeds a little bit into sort of our next our next sort of ingredient of culture, which is we're seeing come through and it's all about inclusivity um, and specifically kind of the impact of being inclusive in the way that you manage your team communication. So with greater flexibility and giving people greater control individually, individually, sorry, arguably comes great responsibility to be proactive in terms of how you kind of manage that into team communication in a really effective way. And the chart that you're looking at on the left hand side is showing the employee net promoter score of the partners could by what proportion of their time spent in meetings is effective. And the results again are huge. So the employee NPS is double with the group that are more likely to feel that their meetings have been run effectively. And we've not shown it on this chart, but the motivation scores of this group were also statistically significantly higher. So more effective meetings, um, more communication equals more engagement. So I guess kind of this leads to some of the natural question of if, you know, if this has such an impact, a material impact on how kind of life at the firm is felt, how do you create those effective meetings? Um, and we'll, well, the results are giving us a really clear steer, actually. So we asked everybody, what makes their interactions effective and what creates inefficiency? And the thing that kind of ran through the thread of almost every response in terms of good and bad was this idea of inclusivity. Those who feel that their teams run really effective team meetings, they talked fairly consistently about, consistently about clear, focused agendas with a structure that created this culture of active participation, this idea that everyone within the team across all levels had a space, had a, had a role and was kind of actively encouraged culturally to kind of get involved. So almost kind of creating that expectation um, culturally that all voices within these meetings will be heard. Uh, and the idea being to like, make sure that everybody knows that they kind of how their work is linking into the goals of the team and everybody else within the team can kind of see the role that they're playing. The teams that had this as kind of part of how they delivered their work and how they worked, significantly more engaged, significantly more motivated in their roles in the firm. Now, conversely, when we asked teams kind of where their communication was poor, what was sitting behind it, they talked of lack of inclusivity, lack of structure, the, the same old voices dominating the conversation with the same old points. So it was almost the, kind of the inverse of that, those ingredients that really led to uh, kind of effective meetings. Again, um, Lisa, kind of any thoughts on or observations on kind of how this is playing out? Oh, I think, first of all, I was having a little chuckle because I think we can all relate to the, the concept that a meet, how a meeting is managed kind of impacts how motivated yeah. we feel afterwards. And we didn't show this finding on the chart, but we actually found that half of meetings didn't hit that 75% effectiveness threshold. And that's not only doing serious damage to the day-to-day -day culture, it's also a lost opportunity to build that high performing environment. But I do think we have to be careful of laying too much sort of responsibility on the partner's shoulders here, and they don't always have the time to prep properly. So, you know, thinking about team makeup and where can this be passed down to someone on the team who might have these natural sort of organization project management type skills with a little training can be very effective in managing these meetings. But the other thing I would say, takeaway from this slide is 
is showing how it's important with this type of data capture to get down to that team level. So it's not enough to look at the results on a question like this at the firm level. You yeah. need to be looking at departments, at bigger teams within departments and locations, because you'll find that certain teams are being run well because of the leaders running those meetings and certain teams aren't. And the average might come to the average. So it's understanding the differences and where the strengths and the weaknesses are. Yeah, and also worth making the point, early findings again, um, whether or not you are doing this remotely or in the office is not impacting the effectiveness. If anything, the early signs are that the, the, the meetings which are being kind of managed proactively in the way that you've just described, Lisa, online, more effective than when people are being forced into the office. So it's it, it's all linked and it's it's all you know really, really compelling. Can we have a look at our third um, ingredient? And this one is arguably, well, we can discuss this, but arguably the most important and potentially the most shocking. Uh, and it's all about kind of, I guess, kind of the importance of creating a culture of support within the firm. So we asked everyone who's participated in the survey so far, if they have someone in the team that they can go to if they need, you know, if they need support, pastoral support, and if they do, do they feel that they are able, you know, culturally to be able to kind of open up to them and ask for kind of help? Now, what we found so far is around half of the partners said that they have somebody within the firm that they can lean on for that pastoral support. And they do feel that their firm culture is such that they have no fear of reaching out and opening up when they need help. And the happiness and likelihood to recommend the firm of these people um, incredibly strong. Um, I think it's around... Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so apologies. Thank you. Andy. It's about 76% yeah. and the happiness score. All, this group is almost giving perfect scores uh, for their happiness when they feel they've got that pastoral support. Um, I guess what's a little bit more worrying is around a third of the, the people who spoke to so far felt that there was somebody at the firm that they could turn to, but crucially, Culturally, they didn't feel comfortable being able to open up, um, maybe a bit of a sign of kind of weakness, whatever that is, these people were significantly less happy uh, and NPS dropped right off. And then around 10 percent uh, of we spoke to so far said that they just didn't have a connection or that kind of connection within the team at all. And the impact on those people, a lot small in number, was huge. These people significantly less engaged and more likely to say, don't work at this firm. Uh, as a group. So you can start to see the importance of being able to develop those personal connections and what impact that's having on your happiness and your engagement. We can also start to see the impact of not creating a culture within the firm where people feel that they can kind of open up, I guess. Um, again, Lisa, you've done work on this space before. What's your kind of reaction when you look at the impact of not having that sort of that connection in the team? Well, first of all, I totally agree that this is the most important important findings so far, which what's worrying me is when we get the reading from the associates, this is going to be much worse, particularly those senior associates who are, you know, not looking to show weakness. Um, so probably much more unlikely to go to support if it is there. But reflecting back, I mean, for high performing attorney attorneys working at the top level, it's it's a case of if not, how, you know, if not, how often are they likely to be overwhelmed? Um, and having that support mechanism is key. Having the culture that it's not only OK, yeah. but it's actually seen as a positive to use that support. And that really helps to cement that camaraderie that, David, you were talking about earlier. I just want to share a story because we conducted some qualitative interviews in support of designing this, this research sort of question set. And there was one story that really stood out to me. And this was a partner who very proactively took time to look for where and how she could support her colleagues. So she would monitor their hours. She would see how often, you know, they were spending evenings in the office. Um, and she gave examples of when if she'd seen someone had been there three, four nights in a row that she would, you know, reach out to them and say, look, particularly those with kids, can I overtake your work for a couple of hours? You go home, see the family, put the kids to bed. I'll pass it back to you to, to be, get back on with. But it's just offering them that lifeline that they just truly inval is invaluable to them. It's helping them deliver on the home front as well as the work front and engenders that loyalty and that longevity that you're looking for from people in their roles. 
Um, and that kind of leads us, it kind of leads us into our sort of fourth area, which is, um, which we're starting to see come through and make a real impact on culture, which is all about um, reward and specifically kind of what behaviours or areas of performance the firms choose to kind of, you know, give currency and reward. So around half the partners that we spoke to so far have said that there are skills that are being delivered in their teams that are crucial to the to the team's functioning that are currently either not recognised or going kind of undervalued through the reward second reward mechanisms. Um, so we've looked into these and what's coming through is they're falling actually really clearly into two clamps, camps. You've got the client development aspect and the team cohesion aspect. So on the client development side, what we're see, what people are seeing is that there's a huge amount of kind of behind the scenes effort required to maintain relationships and kind of build that pipeline uh, of work with their clients that isn't necessarily accounted for in the current measures of success within the firm. That kind of relationship and pipeline development work, absolutely crucial. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes skill. Um, but it's not necessarily kind of recognised as part of the job when it comes to the skills that are being valued by the firm. Now, ultimately, the work that is won obviously is being valued, mm -hmm. but that can only tell, I guess, kind of a fraction of the story in terms of what's involved in kind of developing the relationships and getting to that point. And, you know, arguably, it may, you know, reward short termism when it comes to kind of how you approach the clients, which from the client work we've done in the past, no, doesn't necessarily land well for long term relationships. So I think that's the first one that's coming through, that kind of how do you reward that investment, that kind of those kind of skills that just are required to build that trust in that pipeline of work. The second that's coming through really strongly is all about cohesion. And this kind of picks up on some of the other points that we've been talking about so far. There's a really strong sentiment coming through from this group that the ability to create that kind of social glue within a team, give people a voice, provide that mentoring, be there with encouragement, be that person that people can go to when they're struggling with something. Um, the ability to kind of bring these things to a team is absolutely crucial to how it kind of functions and support, particularly in a remote environment. And at the minute, these skills are either not recognised or potentially in kind of some cases or in some firms that we're seeing through the research, not valued at all. Um, now, what's really interesting is we then went on to ask everybody uh, the specific question around, you know, the, beyond the billable hour, what skills would you like to see built formally into your kind of reward and assessment criteria. And we looked at a long list of 15 or so here. So we're just showing you on the right hand side and kind of some of the few that have started to emerge. But you can see from that list that those areas of team cohesion and client development are right at the top. So I guess kind of what we're seeing come through is partners saying we don't just think these things are kind of soft, fluffy, nice to have skills that are actually crucial to running a successful, high performing team. And ultimately, you know, let's face it, underpinning uh, sustainable profitability if you want to achieve that through the longer term. Uh, and they're seeing it to the extent that, that and what you know, they're kind of seeing it to the extent that what we're seeing come through is a, a kind of a message of make them part of our assessment criteria, create some accountability around these skills, make sure that people understand the value of them in terms of what it takes to kind of create the cohesion and positive culture. Thanks, David. Um, I love these data points and I particularly think the verbatim quotes just bring it to life and just also show how much these partners care about this area. Um, and I guess reflecting on the, the data that's actually there, performance frameworks do need to modernise. I know a lot of firms have, do do this now, but they ideally need to factor in these wider contributions because if you want these behaviours, you can't just rely on people doing the right thing. Um, you do have to reward them because otherwise only certain types of people will fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. And in other teams, there won't be anyone filling those gaps at all. And then people, particularly those who are filling the gaps, start to feel overlooked, they become disengaged and ultimately leave. So this is probably an area where we can start to look to our clients and see how they're looking beyond financial measures to just to recognise success and to monitor and measure success. And I think we have, as law firms have to do the same and start to, to measure these really important mm. parts of yeah. what creates that culture that, that the people so value. Absolutely. Um, 
shall we move on to our final ingredient uh, yeah. of cream culture? Um, and this is all about authenticity um, and how authentic firms are in their approach to being a responsible business. And we saw this come through in that sort of third driver analysis earlier as a real emerging area that people are starting to place value on in their firms. But at a more granular level, we can see here the impact that it can have on how proud partners are of their firm. So if they believe their firm's efforts towards uh, being responsible uh, business are meaningful, we see kind of a really big uptake in kind of what you can see is kind of pride here, but also advocacy um, as well. So we have measures, so kind of we've measured how the extent to which partners feel as though they've kind of committed to their careers to the right firm. And what we found is that those partners who feel their firm is truly committed to pro bono, that their efforts to address climate change are meaningful, that the firm's committed to addressing the diversity challenges in the industry. And I guess ultimately believe that their firm's claims across all of these are authentic. Um, and it's not just a communications exercise. Those partners that see these actions in place at their firms are significantly more likely to feel that they've chosen the right firm to be a part of. So even with the senior group, we can see how the importance of taking these kind of responsible business issues seriously is kind of weaving its way into the fabric of team culture and starting to kind of impact people's experience of it. You know, just reflecting on the last few years, a lot of people have changed their mindsets. And perhaps, as Anthony mentioned earlier, you know, we saw these types of values have been more about attracting the younger talent, but we can see that it's now increasingly important to partners. So it's about people, it's about our planet. Um, and above all else, they just don't want to see their firms making empty platitudes. They want to see authenticity. They want to see actions that actually make a difference. And particularly for this sort of more senior cohort, um, they're probably very wealthy already. They, they want to start thinking about building a legacy beyond those financial results and um, financial rewards. And I, I think that's something that we should really think about in the way that we look at these aspects and engage partners in the responsible business strategies. And Lisa, I'm just fascinated because the first time I've looked at this kind of data, did this come through in the level you thought it would? Did it surprise you in any way? Um, it was a pleasant surprise. It was a pleasant surprise to see them being so, th these data points being so impactful subconsciously as well as consciously. So yes, people say they matter, but we're actually seeing the underlying drivers that they're, they're coming through as well. And I think we'll see these data points just getting stronger as we go further down the sort of uh, seniority. Thank you. So on to the final partner advocacy piece, please, Lisa. Well, it's been fantastic to have this opportunity um, in the first stage, this soft launch of the leading team's concept to, to purely focus on the rank partner data to help understand them in a much sort of broader sense of their needs before we go on to look at associates and business services, et cetera. So, this last visual so shows one of the types of analysis we like to do, which is looking at all of the data points and to find what are those underlying drivers of high performance. And in this case, we're focusing on net promoter score. So that is how likely a partner is to recommend the firm as a place to work. And we can't overlook how much partners play a crucial role in attracting talent and convincing talent to stay. You know, we can have invest and have fantastic communications. It's really them on the front line having those everyday conversations which, which make the difference. So here we're showing you the seven drivers that create the biggest uplift to net promoter score when you get them right. And of course, please keep reminding you, this is for the whole industry. It will be different for different firms because firms that might get one of these elements right with everybody, it then stops being a driver because it's kind of ticked off, it's done. So that's why we'll see a different picture for each firm. So taking it from left to right, from leading up to the most important, I guess, the first in blue there relates to effective communication of strategy. We heard from David earlier about the leadership levers, and this is a lever where the internal communications team plays a crucial role. And it's about continually reinforcing the strategic direction, building belief, helping to build consensus and buy-in. The second looks at predictable workload, and I have to say this is a low-performing area across most firms and certainly 
across the industry. It was the, the bottom of that map that, that David showed earlier. Yes, partners expect to work long hours, but what never gets easier, the more senior they get, is that they're constantly missing personal life commitments. So by find, finding ways to support partners so that they can actually have real time off um, where they can do what they want to do outside of work and others are picking up the slack, they know it's covered, looking to professions like the medical profession and how they manage that. The third builds on the first lever, and that's ensuring that decision making is not only transparent, but also that it relates to the strategy. They don't want surprises that don't make sense. And again, internal communications playing an important role here. The next lever is bonus, um, way more important than salary, base salary or benefits or vacation terms in our analysis. And we just heard from David about how bonus needs to be much more holistic, rewarding a broader set of behaviours, but it's also important to build in flexibility um, and the skills question that David mentioned earlier is showing how different people, different partners bring different skills, we're all different and allowing them to lean into what they do best means that they'll become super performers in that area and then it's about addressing the gaps, not beating them up because they're not, not filling in the gaps themselves, but building into their team people who can fill those gaps or pairing them with other super performers in those complementary areas. The next two are really down to the leaders, the chairs, the CEO, the department heads. There's no escaping this. They have to put the time in with partners, continually re-engaging them, dealing with doubts as they arise, keeping everyone working to the same goals. Um, but it's also up to them to hold partners to account, to not only role model, the right behaviours, but to publicly recognise when people are doing the right thing and to come down hard on bad behaviours. If, if leaders are weak and don't deal with this, then the culture is diluted for everyone. And finally, it's good to see one of our responsible business measures come right up here at the top. And um, this is very much a holistic lever by nature. It's about what the partners are putting in versus what they're getting back. So their time, their energy, their emotional investment versus the reward, both financial and non-financial. What are they giving up by being so committed to the firm and is it worth it? So this is a great overall measure to understand and unpick. Wow, it's a lot in there. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of depth, a lot of depth that's being uncovered in those levers that I think is going to be really important for firms to take action on and I guess uh, direct their investment priorities. But equally, it's going to be um, difficult if they don't get some of these right, because uh, there's still such a, a huge war for talent um, in the market. Do you think, Lisa, that the, the levers will be the same or similar for associates? Well, we already know that from the data we've got that associates across the board are less happy on virtually all measures. Okay. Um, the data that we've seen so far already shows us that career progression responsible business are coming through as stronger levers for associates. Um, but we want to go much deeper than that. We want to understand how the behaviours of partners impact the behaviours of associates. So, you know, thinking back to do they need to be in the office or is it about how they're managing meetings? So really focusing on how can we create those high performing and motivated teams across the firm rather than in specific pockets. Brilliant, I look forward to seeing that uh, when we have it. Um, just finally to, to ask you in, in, to sum up, what are you seeing you know, across the learnings from this study? What are your takeaways, Lisa, uh, that firms should be thinking about in this space at the moment? I guess thinking what we've called the product, <laughs> this insight is all about leading teams and how to create more of them for the long term. So not quick fixes, really creating the, that structure to, and that, that richness to our cultures. And firms already have well-developed talent strategies. We can't tell anybody on this call how, how to do their job better, but we want to provide fresh new insights to help finesse these strategies, help get that extra little edge. And more importantly, I guess, to provide sound evidence on which to make investments, to challenge the assumptions of the leaders, um, ultimately to stop leaders guessing and arm them with data that they need to make sound decisions. 
So, I mean, you know, I'd like to obviously encourage all firm, firms to get involved. And even if you can't commit to a full firm wide survey this time, try a smaller sample, learn from the industry, see how you compare at a high level. And we truly believe that you'll want to take it wider and broader next time. And I guess the last thing to say is just anybody who hasn't worked with us before, you know, I can promise you that this survey is going to build, it'll evolve, it'll grow. And yes, you'll be able to benchmark not just to peers, but over time. But you'll also learn something new every time as we add in new questions and learn from the data as it grows. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of you for, for your contributions. So as well as the, uh, sharing these insights, we wanted to briefly outline how simple it is to participate in the benchmark for your firms and what you will get if you do. And could you just outline the deliverables for our participating firms, please? Sure. Thanks, um, Lisa, David and Joe. Fascinating insights there. Um, so what do we deliver once the benchmark is built? So the product comes in two parts, as you can see here. So the first is the market analysis. You've seen today a really small snippet of the kind of analysis we will deliver. Um, this will explore the whole data set to understand the big themes, the emerging trends and the direction of the market, looking at the profession from all angles of geography, practice, sector, role, seniority and function. The product will give firms a sense of how their organisation fits into the bigger picture and how they might, as Lisa was saying, prioritise investment. The second, the client analysis, which comes in two parts. Firstly, your talent ops team gets a dashboard with all the market data that will enable them to view the data against a meaningful peer group and filter based on location, practice group, role and gender. But we'll also analyse the firm's data ourselves, looking at the correlations between the questions and deliver a personalised presentation and a report to the firm on how you're performing next to your peer group and what areas are most critical to work on or improve to seize an opportunity. Um, and I'll just give you a kind of a snapshot of what that um, might look like. So just to help you visualise what the client analysis report, uh, how it will manifest itself. We've chosen to display here a snapshot of um, how we would begin to analyse flight risk within the theme of career progression. The example being here that we've identified the greatest flight risk at the senior Fiona level. After that, we would uh, then unpick what's driving those flight risks with spe specific analysis of demographics and present what we can learn from the market to reduce those risks. That's great. And so firms can build their own peer group for that benchmark and? Yeah, completely. So when research begins, we ask the firm to nominate a minimum of 10 firms that they want to track themselves most closely against. And then within the dashboard, that will be that will appear that that peer group will be the ones identified. And within our client analysis, we'll also apply those that peer group to, to anything that we analyse and, and present. That's fantastic. Thank you. And so in terms of our timeline, the survey is open to participants across all roles in firms until the end of September. But to sign up to participate, you must do so before the end of June. Uh, and if you wish to do so, please contact uh, Anthony or myself. Um, and as Lisa was outlining, if you want to focus on a cohort or a smaller group within your firm with a minimum of 100 responses, we are accepting this option as firms are evaluating uh, this tool and helping to build this benchmark for the legal community. So to get involved, please do reach out to Anthony or myself and put our details on the screen for you. Um, and obviously we would love also to jump in to the Q&A. So thank you so much panelists for your contributions. And I'm gonna hand over to Alex, who's gonna open up the Q&A. Thank you everyone. And thank you all to all those that presented. Um, so we've had a few questions. Um, the first is about the benchmark. Can we just unpack that a little bit? A few questions about it. What is it going to encompass? How is it going to work and what can a firm expect? And then if you want to sort of follow on from that, uh, next series of questions was related to uh, Chambers rankings and how would this data and insights potentially impact any of the rankings that a firm receives? So kind of a few questions there. Shall I direct the first one to Joe? Uh, on the benchmark and then Absolute, the second part to Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, in terms of the benchmark, um, as Ant was outlining earlier, it's, it's something that we will build for a firm. So they will work with us and tell us which um, peer firms they're most interested in including in their benchmark. We'll have a minimum of 10, so the data will be aggregated. And then your own firm's results will be compared to your benchmark firms. It will be always aggregated. You won't be able to look at the individual firms in the benchmark due to competition law. Um, and that will be available on the dashboard and also in the client analysis deliverables that you see. Have I missed anything, team? No? Okay, um, great. No, I don't think so. I think on, on benchmark, to me, it means something that you're able to compare in a meaningful way. Um, so quite often uh, in th this industry and elsewhere, you'll see the term benchmark thrown around. Um, is the is what is presented in the benchmark useful? And that's kind of what we've been basing all our work on. But you, you can't generate a benchmark if people can't do anything with it, and if the results aren't actually meaningful. So that's everything what that this project is about. And the second part of the question was around the chamber's rankings app. Yeah, well, let's contribute to, in any way. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, have to pick that one up. No, there's no relationship between this and the Chambers rankings. So um, Chambers Talent Research already sits completely separate from the Chambers rankings. Uh, this is obviously like a new project, a new research project and a, an extension of that. Um, but there won't be any impacts of it. And all the results that are presented through this are going to be private and confidential for the law firm to use internally. Um, there's no, not, not going to be any um, publishing of the results or any kind of public rankings, ratings or anything like that. Um, so two completely separate um, work streams. Yeah, although it's worth adding that um, in a positive sense that we are going to obviously isolate like we already have the responses from the ranked partners because we want to see if they're running their teams in a different way from mm -hmm. other other partner teams. So once we've got a fuller data set, we'll be able to isolate that group and see if there's anything that our subscribing firms can learn from. And also when we've been talking to ranked partners about this, they are quite keen on the concept in the sense that they want to understand what's going on within their teams that is working and also what could be improved and what are they doing or not doing that others are doing. So I think that's an interesting angle in itself mm -hmm. that some of them are keen to learn from this project. Completely. Yeah. And, and that's actually one of the reasons why we started the project, because we were hearing from quite a few partners across the world that this was a problem that they needed answers to. And we felt that we were able to start and step in. OK, thank you. Uh, can we just spend a little bit of time just talking about the geographic spread of those that have completed the data and insights so far? Uh, what's happened so far what the plans will be to kind of get that kind of spread across uh, the right kind of geographies who wants to jump in on that david do you want to take that one um yeah happy to so uh in the in this kind of initial shots well, apologies this initial soft launch that we're looking at at the moment uh the data that we've talked to today is primarily being spread across the um uk and the us uh, so it's been focused on those two markets but obviously as we kind of move out across the rest of the year the idea is to kind of expand that um, as wide as we possibly can. Uh, but the, the focus in this first year is we're going to be a real kind of focus of our energy is across um, across the US and kind of the UK as the sort of the primary drivers at the moment. Longer term, we think you know this is will develop and become hopefully a truly global piece of work. Uh, but it's kind of primarily focusing on those kind of those two core markets uh, in the first instance, with the view that it will kind of expand over the course of the rest of the year. Great. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, that just about wraps up the questions that we've had so far. Uh, Joe, shall I come to you for sort of final closing remarks? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for uh, your time, everyone. I know it's been a lot of uh, work even getting the, the early data to this point, and I'm personally really excited to see the next wave of data, which I imagine will be over the summer, looking in more depth at the associates and obviously as the benchmark grows. So. Thank you all for your contributions. Um, we're really keen to uh, hear from anyone today with feedback from the session, but also um, about how you can get involved. And, and thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone.